Art. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Now, last time we had you on, we were talking about the Federal Reserve's uh, tightening of uh, monetary policy and how you thought that would lead to stocks uh, falling significantly. Now, it seems like we've actually seen more of that, more tightening. And in the last couple of weeks, we've seen in the United States and around the world, the stock market's tanking. Uh, what is your perspective on what is happening right now? Well, I've been saying since, uh, gosh, probably about a year now, when I first started noticing a big cluster of Hindenburg omens last November, December, that I, I think, you know, that was the blow off. Um, and we're in the midst of a, of a topping, major topping process right now in the stock market. In fact, you know, I, I think I wrote an article about it um, a couple of weeks ago. We had on the New York Stock Exchange, we had 11 Hindenburg omens in a row after Labor Day um, last month. And that's never happened before. <laughs> so there were signs that there was a major dispersion going on in the markets. And people you know, it's coming to people's attention now that we're seeing stocks like the home builders and the automakers and the bank stocks and industrials and a lot of these these companies that are really economically sensitive, we're seeing these stocks down 30, 40% in a lot of cases. And so far, you know, the S&P has, has held up, but um, I do believe we're just in the midst of a, of a major topping process right now. Hey, Jesse, if you don't mind for listeners out there, just giving them a background, a little bit of background on the Hindenburg phenomenon this uh, that you're, that you're describing. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, uh, basically, when you're at new highs um, and the major indexes are within 5% or something like that, mm -hmm. and then you see not only a, a bunch of new highs within the index, but a lot of new lows also. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something like when, when new highs and new lows both make up more than 2% of you know, the underlying components or something like that. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm at the top of my head, not sure. familiar with the exact... But it's essentially, it's a sign of that widening dispersion, right? When, when you have right. a really good, healthy uptrend and new highs, you should not be seeing a ton of new lows. Um, and so, you know, the Hindenburg Omen was developed to kind of be a signal as a potential uh, crash indicator. And, you know, I've, I, I've always thought that one omen is, you know, not always a great uh, indicator of that. But when I look at uh, omens over time, and so... You know, over a period of 10 days or a month. In fact, over the last month, we've seen 24 Hindenburg omens triggered across the NYSE and the NASDAQ. And just to, you know, put that in perspective, at the 2000 top and the 2007 top, we saw about 14, 15 omens trigger in a month's time. We've now seen 24 over the past month. So to me, the, the, the signs of that breath, breath dispersion underneath the surface of the market are pretty darn clear. Yeah. I mean, most people going about their day-to-day -day business are just looking to see the S&P 500 number, maybe even the Dow, if they don't understand how ridiculous that, that composite is. I mean, that's all they're looking at. They probably aren't even going in to look at their their their, their shares as far as individually day-to-day. -day. So it's a, it's an interesting point that you're, that you're putting out there. I wanted to, to, to kind of move back a little bit. Last time we spoke, it was in July, I think July 20th. We had talked a little bit about Netflix uh, and, and, you know, the situation that it was in. Uh, it's kind of treaded water, gone sideways, had some issues. It looks like uh, some bad headlines recently. But I wanted to, to swing back towards something you've been writing about a lot. Um, I think you've done a couple blogs on it. Uh, the Fang versus Bang stock phenomenon. You've, uh, you know, you described the fact that there's, A, there's more ETFs now traded than individual stocks in the S&P 500. The rise of passive investing, how that kind of... It kind of coincides with uh, investment trust in the 20s. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because I found the point interesting, the fact that, you know, passive ETFs, uh, they have a lot of exposure to FANGs and not so much to the banks. And, and so maybe you could talk about a, a little bit about that, that study that you did um, and how maybe that's keeping gold miners in, uh, in a place where they are at the moment. Yeah, you know, I, I think that really um – the you know this is another speculative mania in financial assets uh you know the bond market is crazy has been for a while but this you know the stock market too that you know i've talked about it as you know uh, an everything bubble where prices of all financial assets have gone 
you know, to ridiculous heights again. And I think that's driven by this passive investing mania. And I, and I call it a mania because I think people believe that if I just put money into the indexes, I'll make money over time, regardless of the price that I pay, regardless of earnings growth, regardless of any of these fundamentals. And, you know, that, that's, you know, kind of mania type thinking, right? Only during a mania can you believe that no matter what price I pay, I'm going to make good money over the next 10 years. And that's what people believe. And, and so it's the only money that's been flowing into them and the markets has been flowing in through these passive products. And so, you know, the number of ETFs out there have exploded and the assets, you know, it's, it's in the, you know, trillions of dollars, four or five trillion dollars in ETFs now. Um, and that's been driving the markets. If you, so if you, you look at the FANG stocks, you know, the average FANG stock has something like 150 ETFs that are heavily exposed to a FANG stock. Wow. And so money flows into these ETFs and it goes into the, the biggest names, you know, like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Mm-hmm. Um, I throw Apple and Nvidia in there sometimes too, because, you know, they've, they've also benefited. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I thought, you know, it would be interesting to look at the bank stocks, which are the, the four big gold miners. I look at Barrick, Agnico Eagle, um, Newmont, and Gold Corp, and see what does is, what is the uh, ETF exposure look like here. Uh, and maybe that would help explain why these the stocks have done, you know, poorly uh, in recent years. Obviously, the gold price has come down from 2011, but the, the mining stocks have done, you know, very poorly relative to the metal and uh you know, the performance relative, you know, you look at a ratio of the mining stocks to the S&P and they're about as cheap as they've ever been. Right. And you look at, you know, I mean, Newmont has um, some exposure to ETFs, but outside of that, you know, there's, there's literally like, you could count them on one hand, the number right. of ETFs that own, you know, Gold Corp, Agnico, and, and Barrick. And to me, that's just a sign that these things have been left for dead. And, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, there, there's really only way, only one way for them to go, which is, you know, everybody who's, who's wanted to sell them has sold them. And, uh, you know, the, the only way this, you know, ownership can go is, is one direction towards, you know, mm-hmm. people having to, having to buy more of these things. So I, you know, I called them the, the greatest anti-passive trade <laughs> that if you, if you think passive is a mania and it's going to unwind. Uh, money's going to flow into gold and the miners, um, you know, on the flip side of that trade. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the ETF ownership there kind of bears that out. Yeah. Now, looking at the macro picture, um, as we're talking about this uh, maybe stock uh, crash that's going to happen in the near future, where do you see the money going? You're saying maybe uh, precious metals. I mean, there's a lot of different sectors, right? We're seeing um, also rates rise we're seeing the 10-year treasury uh yield at about a five-year high um where there's a lot of money out there if we look at these three sectors stocks bonds and precious metals where is the money going to flow well i think you know that's that's a very interesting question and it's you know impossible to predict but i'm operating Mm -hmm. under the guise that that economic growth is slowing amidst rising inflation. I, you know, over the past year and a half, Alan Greenspan has been saying, you know, we are headed for stagflation. And, um, you know, you can think whatever you want about Alan Greenspan, um, you know, the problems he's caused in the economy and the boom-bust cycle in the markets. Um, I, he's still, you know, uh, very well-versed in, well-versed in the economy and what's driving it. And I, and I do think we're actually probably on the verge of stagflation right now if we're not already in it. I mean, you look at, you know, auto sales and home sales are, are falling, but, you know, wage growth is still rising and costs are rising. And a lot of this is a function of not just end of cycle um, type of um, type of pressures, you know, uh, inflation pressures. I think there's, you know, the secular enforce, uh, forces of inflation that are at work too, which is deglobalization, um, you know, uh, bringing back, you know, jobs from overseas is, you know, a massive inflationary impulse. Global, globaliza- gl- sorry, globalization was probably the most disinflationary force of the past several decades. And so a reversal of that is bringing inflation back uh, in a way that we haven't seen for a long, long time. 
Um, and then you see, you know, the fiscal, you know, policies that are going on, a massive tax cut. You know, Trump's talking about another tax cut. We're talking about infrastructure spending. So I'm looking at this economic slowdown that we're seeing right now as more of a stagflationary type of episode with different from the past two recessions that we've seen, which are more kind of deflation. We didn't see actual deflation, but they were, they were kind of a deflationary effect. Um, and so I'm operating under the guise that, you know, this is, this is not likely to be another one of those. We're more likely to see a rising inflation and slowing real growth type of phenomenon, which would be very bad for financial assets because it, it means rising interest rates. Uh, and the only way to really protect yourself is to to focus on real assets and namely precious metals. Right. I mean, the last time we had a situation of stagflation that you're describing, it's well before most of us were alive or some of us were just born. Right. So we're talking 1970s. That was the last time we had a situation where interest rates were rising. But yet, uh, you know, uh, obviously all the things that you discussed, inflation was very, very high. Um Jesse, I wanted to talk and go back uh, another blog that you've recently written about how you go about discovering trends. You know, I, I went through your Twitter feed before we got on the call today. It's um, it's a great Twitter feed. Your Twitter feed is very wide in the stuff that you read every day. Go, if you could explain to your readers or to the listeners your process, what you do like as far as keeping up with trends and, and, and how thorough that can be. Sure. You know, I, I – um I, I really, I, I read up, uh, I wrote a post about this recently because uh, I interviewed my friend Mark Yusko a couple times over the past year, and he introduced me a book called The Dow Jones Averages. And the guy who wrote that book is a real fascinating guy, has a unique look at the markets, and he talks about, you know, uh, and, and I, it's not just, you know, this book or this this company. Uh, a lot of the most successful investors I've met and I've known um, really spend a ton of time digging uh, the the developments within their industry. You know, Fred Hickey, I also interviewed recently, and, yeah. and he stays on top of, you know, the tech world better than anybody I've ever come across because – through his contacts, but also just through reading, you know, uh, real specific kind of sector type semiconductor journals and these types of things. And so that's what I try and kind of do on a macro scale is pay attention to what are, what are the major themes that are developing, um, you know, in the financial markets. And the way I do that is just kind of by trying to cover the widest area of uh, news and things. It's mm -hmm. not just Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. It's, you know, Wired Magazine. It's, you know, just a, a wide variety of different things to see, you know, what, what, what is really developing, what kind of narratives are developing out there. Um, and, and to me, that, that helps me pay attention to kind of things like this stagflationary idea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the backlash against big tech is another one I've been writing about mm -hmm. for about a year and a half now. Um, and that one's still developing and is still growing. And, and so, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I spent a few hours every morning just reading, uh, through a ton of, ton of stuff to try and, uh, put together these, these types of developing narratives. And by the way, kudos on that podcast you did with Fred Hickey. I, that's a really good one. Uh, it's like an hour and 10 minutes. And I think it's just a month or so old. So listeners out there, if you want to listen to that podcast, it's great. I mean, the process that Fred Hickey talked about going through to do what he does in the semiconductor world is in, in pretty amazing, the amount of work he puts in. And then he also has reasons why he buys gold mining shares as well and, and why he's a bull for gold in the long term. So really good interview. And that's, kudos to you, Jesse. It was really good. Yeah, thanks. Fred is a brilliant guy. Yeah. Now, moving forward here, you were talking, Jesse, about um, how we're seeing we're going to see a lot of stagflation coming in the future. You know, as uh, James was talking about, a lot of us don't remember this um, when it happened in the 70s. Uh, what for like the average person? How is that going to impact their lives? Well, there's, there's, to me, I just keep finding, you know, talk about these, these, uh, these themes or narratives that I'm on. I keep finding parallels with the, the late sixties, um, to the current period. And if you look at actually just, you know, I, I've tweeted this chart a couple of times. Um, you know, the Fed removed accommodative from the language recently. And, and I, I just, I, I couldn't resist. I had to, I had to say, 
uh, tweet that, you know, uh, this is the most accommodative Fed policy since the late 1960s. I mean, very, we've never seen it before where the Fed funds rate is essentially negative still in real terms. And we're at 3.7% unemployment. It's absolutely uh, insane. It's still massively accommodative. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, the, the, you know, that trend, Trump criticizing the Fed is another one that, you know, mm-hmm. dates back to that, you know, 60s, you know, between, you know, Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon, you know, both pressuring different Fed heads to keep interest rates low. You see this, Trump doing the same thing now with Jay Powell. And so, you know, there's there's just a lot of um, parallels between mm-hmm. those times um, today and back then. And, you know, uh, essentially what we saw then was, you know, stock market peaked in, you know, late 60s, we saw a little bear market in the late 60s, but the 73, 74 bear market was the one where the markets really woke up to inflation and that uh, inflation was out of control and the Fed was going to have, was, was behind the curve. And so I, you know, I see something similar today where it's, to me, it's pretty obvious the Fed is behind the curve. The tightening they've already done is slowing down the economy. So they're in a real, I, I call it, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible decision the Fed has to make. And it's a decision between the devil and the deep blue sea. Um, you either choose the devil, which is, okay, we're going to have to raise interest rates to keep inflation under control. But we risk undoing all the stuff that we did to boost financial markets over the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, at least we know we're going to keep inflation in check. Uh, the deep blue sea is the scenario where they say, okay, we want to try and keep propping up the markets. We don't want to raise interest rates too fast. That's where you get inflation that runs out of control. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's ne- neither scenario is a good thing for the economy or the markets. But I think the Fed understands that a hyperinflationary scenario is something, you know, they have to guard against that above all else. Mm -hmm. And so they cannot accept the deep blue sea, which is inflation running out of control. They have to tighten policy. And even if the economy is slowing, even if the markets roll over. And so this is where you start talking about potentially the expiration of the Fed put where inflation is going to prohibit the Fed from coming in and being able to try and save the markets because they can't, they're going to have to keep tightening policy or at least, at the very least, they're not going to be able to cut interest rates or re, re implement QE because inflationary pressures are still there. Mm-hmm. So, so to me, this, that's, that's what investors should be thinking about is that for the first time in, you know, since 1987 or, you know, before that, the Fed put might not be there anymore. Hey, Jesse, do you do much uh, studying as far as the U.S. dollar strength versus other currencies? I mean, there's people out there, you know, depending on which camp you talk to, obviously some people are more bearish or bullish in the medium term, say the next year or two. There's a big camp out there that does think that the U.S. dollar, for whatever geopolitical reasons, is going to start strengthening uh, even further than it's been. You know, obviously it had strength in 2015 and it's kind of been sideways for the last couple of years. But there are some people out there who think in the coming years there may be another squeeze for for further um, dollar demand and so is there is there possibly one more pop for the US dollar do you do you foresee coming I mean yeah I mean there could be in the short run I you know I, I try and simplify the currency question I mean there's there's two things that I look at in terms of the dollar one is just the federal deficit the dollar and the deficit are highly correlated over longer periods of time the deficit is widening that's bearish fundamentally yeah. for the dollar um, and, you know, if we get a recession, the, the deficit's going to blow out. We're going to see $2 trillion in the deficit, and the dollar's just going to absolutely, you know, have a ton of pressure on it. But, you know, to go along with that, that's kind of me, the fundamental side. The sentiment side of it is, you know, traders are so bullish on the dollar and bearish euros, bearish yen, um, that you look at the commitment of traders report, and, you know, the people are massively long the dollar right now. Mm-hmm. So, that tells me that both fundamentals and sentiment from a contrarian standpoint are bearish for the dollar and that it's, it, I mean, yes, it could, there's, who knows, it could pop in the short run, but, but longer term over the next year, one to three years, the dollar's headed lower. I think we're in the midst of a dollar bear market. This rally that we've seen uh, was driven a lot by just the repatriation of funds by corporations. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, fundamental reasons why the dollar should be rallying. Um, 
And if the, you know, I mean, it, it comes back to the Fed too, and and you know, the Fed's going to have to keep raising, but also Bank of Japan and ECB are are going to be, you know, tightening too. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think that the Fed might be tightening less in relation to those central banks over the next couple of years, which would also be, you know, bearish for yeah. the dollar. So. Um, but, you know, the other thing to think about in terms of the dollar, Stan Druckenmiller recently gave an interview to Real Vision that was pretty interesting. He, he talked about in the late 2000s, one of the reasons he became very bearish on the stock market was the dollar, interest rates, and oil prices were all rising. And in the past, that had been a very bearish thing for corporate earnings. Well, what's been going on over the last year? <laughs> the dollar, interest right. rates, and oil prices have all been rising. Yeah. And so I think that's what the market's starting to to uh, try and reckon with a little bit here is that earnings growth over the next 12 months is going to really slow down, if not go negative. Oh, thanks for that. Now, in one of your recent articles, Jesse, you were talking about how many investors are relying really on kind of a one-dimensional view, as you said, of investing. Um, they're really essentially just momentum traders they're look or they're only following current trends so with that kind of habit of a lot of uh traders how is that going to impact like the dynamics of the market going forward um if you know we we start to see as we we're, we've been seeing uh over the last couple of weeks stock market the stock market fall people it seems like following your view are going to be it's going to be fear on right it's going to be a a uh, big fear trade right now. Yeah, you know, I, I think you know, I, I I write that because you know people try and make a point about the markets and well, they're not that expensive at twenty two times earnings. And when you actually think about you know the valuations of the stock market, well, twenty two times earnings is actually historically pretty high. But they're not not thinking about what is underlying that it's the highest profit margins in history. So if profit margins normalize, you're talking about a 40, 50 PE currently. So people just look at these things in isolation and don't think about, you know, what's underlying the PE ratio. But I think, you know, in terms of one dimensional strategies, passive investing is essentially just momentum investing. Um, and I think a lot of those people are, are, are just momentum investors. And then maybe another one dimensional strategy that's real popular today is just trend following. And so you have these two one dimensional strategies that are very popular momentum and trend following. And if we run out of momentum and the trend reverses lower, in fact, we're trading below the 200 day moving average right now on the S and P. So by a lot of people's, you know, a lot of trend followers, you know, standards, you know, Paul Tudor Jones standard, the S and P is now in a downtrend. So if you get trend followers reversing and you get momentum traders go, oh, no, the momentum's not working to the upside anymore. And the tell for that is the FANG stocks. You know, once the FANG stocks start outperforming to the downside, you know, then then I think you'll start to see, uh, you know, these these trades reverse themselves where momentum investors try and liquidate, trend followers try and liquidate at the same time. And, you know, to me, that one of the biggest signals of, of how much risk is out there in the markets is just the the net free credits uh, at, at brokerage firms um, right now. And it's about three times bigger than it was at the peak of the dot-com mania. I mean, another way to look at it is just margin debt, right, leverage right. being being used in, in the markets. And um, it's just, it's so massive today that I look at that as potent, what is the potential forced selling once the market turns south? And the potential forced selling for margin calls or whatnot um, is as big as anything we've seen. And so, you know, the the risk once this stuff, thing reverses is is much bigger than most people appreciate currently. I saw an older colleague of mine uh, who just did a, a blog, basically a video blog on this topic, and he was opening a Charles Schwab account and stating that uh, – you know, a, uh, they, they basically automated uh, margin account agreements. And uh, so there's like very little risk. You know, you can click and learn about the risk if you're going to read a 50 page diatribe. But uh, flat it out, you just press a button and yeah, margins yours. And Lord, these people, they have no idea about what they're up against if this thing goes rever- rever- reverses on them. So it's I totally agree. The margin has gotten crazy. Um, yeah. One thing, Jesse, I wanted to throw out there and, you know, I've 
I, I go to your blog all the time. I check out your work. I, you know, I've never gotten to actually subscribe for your for your uh, service, but I want you to, to to tell me about it. What, what's what, what is in your service, your uh, yearly service that you sell on your website? Yeah, I mean, I, I write a weekly market comment that that I try and write a, a much more expansive view of some of these trends that I'm I'm paying attention to. So, you know, I'm, we talked about stagflation last weekend. I wrote a, a much more detailed um, uh, kind of uh, uh, discussion of uh, the the signs of the, these things and, and and how they're they're playing out now. So that's you know part of it but really you know where i feel like I, if i have any expertise at all in the markets it's in individual stocks i mean the macro right. stuff is i think something we've been forced to pay attention to just based on what central banks have been doing around the world in the past 10 years mm-hmm. but it's the micro stuff where is that is my bread and butter and so i, I look for individual stocks where i see and a lot of the times, these are these are stocks like the bank stocks, which are outside of the purview of the major indexes, outside of the purview of passive investing, uh, where you know you might find something that's cheap that technically looks interesting, and I see a, a very some very compelling insider activity. So CEO, mm-hmm. CFO, um, just buying a ton of stock, uh, and you know on the reverse side too. I just wrote a, a recent thing about. Salesforce.com technically looked like it was potentially rolling over. The cash flow statement had a couple of red flags. And then I saw some top executives, several of them, chief accounting officer, chief financial officer included, both selling 60, 70, 80% of their shares in the company, which all kind of, to me, goes, okay, I need yeah. to sit up and take notice. This looks pretty darn bearish. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, so those are the types of things I look for and write about on the micro side. Cool. Thank you for that. All right. Well, Jesse Felder, thank you so much for joining us.